I feel reasonably secure in my ability to fake my way through that. So, uh, <laughs> as always, as always on this show. Hi, everybody. It's No Show. I'm Matt Brown, uh, joined as always by Jeff Borman. And this week, we are uh, cultural critics. We are bringing our refined critical eye to a podcast, another podcast. That's right. We're getting meta. Uh, we're doing it on a podcast called Business Wars, and it's done by Wondery. I'm sure everybody out there has heard of Wondery. And they've done something like 89 seasons of this pod called Business Wars. <laughs> and they take on like all of these different companies that have competed against each other over the last 100 years or so. And a couple of months ago, they dug into Hilton versus Marriott. I think to non-hotel people, they're like, wait a minute, was there really a battle royale that spanned generations and continents between two headstrong founders and the children and business titans who followed them? Short answer, yes. Long answer might be a little more complicated. Today, of course, Hilton is comprised of 17 brands with more than 5,900 properties in 114 countries around the world. Marriott International, same deal, controls over 7,000 properties in 131 countries including the Ritz-Carlton, St. Regis luxury brands, and the family still owns like something like 18% of the company's share, so still has a really prominent voice in how the how the company functions. Uh, Jeff, first of all, what did you think about uh, Hilton versus Marriott? You have been in the hotel game for a long time. You worked for Marriott for a long time. You know, it reminded me a bit of the Adam Richmond show, uh, the food that built America. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I love it. It's a history behind, you know, how Kraft or how Heinz uh, came to prominence. And um, I, I thought it was, a, you know, overall uh, a pretty good dramatization. By the way, Matt, you mentioned Marriott International Control, 7,000 properties. I think it's like eight and a half thousand now or something, but... Uh, overall, listen, I found it very entertaining. Uh, you know, my background, I spent nearly 20 years at Marriott, three at Hilton. Um, for Hilton, uh, the competition is m more in its DNA, right? Cause Chris Nassetta is an alpha win, win, win type guy. And with him at the helm, I think Hilton takes on a little bit more of maybe the personality of, you know, the us versus them kind of stuff, the win approach, uh, at Marriott, uh, in my years there, I really cannot recall a single moment where the motivation was to beat Hilton or Hyatt, right? Marriott focuses entirely on itself, right? Internally, uh, it thinks generationally. I know that when Marriott starts referencing comparisons to Hilton, I actually think it's a that means they're kind of showing a weakness, right? If they go, uh, we're better than Hilton, uh, I think that actually means they're not very comfortable with where they are. So I don't, I don't really see um, necessarily some of the some of the background and the drama that Business Wars really presented, but that's what also made it an entertaining, uh, you know, four or five chapters to listen to. When you were working for Marriott, how much would you talk about the competition? You know, I, I think at a hotel level, all the time, right? Uh, this Hilton Hotel competing for business against that other hotel. And many times that's, of course, a Marriott. Uh, but it's also a Hyatt and a scenery. You, you name it. You name all the brands in the business, right? If you're out there competing at a hotel level to win a group or a convention or an account, uh, competition is right there every day at the forefront of the narrative. Uh, but at the brand level, I really don't, I really don't hear about it that much. I mean, the podcast, I think we should stop for a second and say, I think it's worth listening to this podcast if you're part of the hotel industry or if you're just kind of interested in these two brands or how brands work. Uh, I think it's worth a listen. The, the episodes go by very quickly. They're loaded with stories. They're very mm -hmm. dramatic. The whole series sort of resembles like, well, like one of those old ABC miniseries like Shogun or Winds of War. And the voice acting can be next level. It takes a second to get into it because it is so dramatic. But by episode three, I'm completely in on this. And I, I just I can't do justice to how they do it. But they'll they'll uh, they'll talk about conversations between business titans and and they'll do like little accents, kind of folksy accents for each one. <laughs> and and it, it's like you're yeah, it's like you're plunged into this story of the frontier. Did you have any like favorite stories out of this? <laughs> you know, my favorite, like you're talking about, there was one where uh, J.W. Marriott 
this is a quote, right? Bangs his fist on the boardroom table like a furious toddler. Really? Where did they get that? Like who's <laughs> right? Who who gave the insight that he banged his fist like a toddler? Yeah, I, I find that pretty hard to believe. Points to the script script people <laughs> on that one. You know, one of my favorite stories from the pod is in the first episode. They talk about the origins of of each brand and. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know a lot about how each brand started. You know, I think when I moved to DC and we met, and I think you were already working for Marriott, like I knew Marriott was based there, but I didn't really know why. I didn't know the connection to it. Hilton, kind of, I I had only known some Hilton history through uh, the depiction of Conrad Hilton on Mad Men. Uh, this actor, I cannot remember his name. It's Chelsea something. He shows up on Billions too. He's great. And he uh, he did a definitive portrayal of Conrad Hilton in Mad Men. But he, this the episode one story of how Hilton kind of got into the game is really evocative. Even if you don't want to listen to the whole pod, the yeah. uh, that first episode where he kind of goes into a bank, he's trying to buy a bank in Cisco, Texas, because there's an oil boom there. And the bank owner doesn't want to sell. So now he's stuck in Cisco. He's got to wait a day before he can leave. So he tries to go get a hotel room. And there is a line out the door of this little put on hotel in Cisco. So he kind of muscles his way up uh, to see the owner. And it's like, ah, we're closed. You have to come back in eight hours. It's like eight hours. What are you talking about? Why? Oh, because that's when all the beds turn over. This hotel was doing so much business that they were renting out rooms to people who were going out and working the oil fields and coming back in, sleeping for eight hours, then going back on and doing a single or double shift. And then the light went off in his head. His family had already run a hotel, I think in New Mexico, where he grew up. And a light went off in his head that he could potentially make as much money, if not more money, uh, as a hotel owner than he could as a bank owner. I thought that was such an interesting, interesting start to his his story because it, you know, for both Hilton and Marriott, both those brands are so rooted in the family that started them. And I think the podcast shines light on what became a very American arc through all businesses where this kind of family control and this personal stamp of what something is over the decades gives way to investor boards and focus groups and international uh, investors and this uh, whole other group of people who are talking about what the brand is versus this one person controlling it. And that happens across so many businesses, but I feel like with hotels in particular, you see that very clearly. I don't know. I I, I don't want to overly romanticize uh, the, that kind of single owner model, but I do think something is a little lost when these hotels are owned by big investment groups versus one person's vision. Yeah. I mean, both companies are a century old. Hilton uh, has been around maybe a decade longer. I think Hilton turned a hundred in 2019. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marriott joined the club in the Centurion club in 27. Uh, But Hilton, to your point, I think it was a hotel company from the start, right? The origin story you just told, whereas Marriott didn't really transform from a restaurant company to a hotel company until in the 60s, let's say, really in the 70s is when they started taking off as a really hotel first kind of company. Um, you know, one of the things that I had forgotten about that I thought was fun was they walk through the bed wars of the aughts. Oh, yeah. I think up until the late 90s and 2000s, hotel rooms up and down the economic food chain were fairly staid and predictable. Some were nicer than others. You know, some were in historic buildings, some had a nicer lobby. But the interior experience of a hotel room, I think, up and I didn't stay in that many up until the 90s, but up until that time, I think it was a pretty basic experience. The soaps, the TVs, the sheets, the beds were somewhat indistinguishable, particularly when you were within a certain level, like your economy level. Um, I mean, y- your beds are probably not going to be as good as they were if you were staying at a Westin, but generally speaking, everything in like a business traveler space kind of all looks the same once you're in the room. And I think when you got to the 90s and 2000s, that changed and the bed wars were part of that. Do you remember the bed wars? Weston's heavenly bed was genius branding. Everybody's having their go at a better product. What's your stick? Uh, And the heavenly bed was just 
it was maybe Weston's finest moment. Another thing I thought the show mentioned that I thought was pretty interesting was that the W brand uh, was named so that it could quickly adapt to Weston if it failed. And perhaps the, you know, the, the rumor that you and I've talked about that it, was an upside down M as Barry Sternlich was kind of giving the finger over to Mr. Marriott with it, right? We're going to be everything but Marriott. We're anti Marriott, which of course has great irony today. Uh, w being a part of the Marriott chain, but uh, no, I thought that was really cool. W, they're like, oh, we're just going to hedge our bets a little bit, just in case we got to throw Weston on it. It's interesting to think about because I think when when you and I met, you were working at the Mayflower, very famous hotel in DC. I think historic hotels and kind of expo center, conference center hotels aside. I also think that up until the turn of the century, new hotel construction that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of going to a new hotel to hang out. Like I'm not going to go to a a restaurant or bar in some new hotel in DC or New York to just kind of go out socially. And I feel like the W kind of opened that door, especially for the boutique hotels that would come in after like over the last 20 years to this day w reverses the f and b right f and b food and beverage across the industry it's f and b right and w calls it bnf you know i mean w does a lot of quirky things just to not be normal uh, but to your point uh, that's the heartbeat of the hotel is lead with beverage uh, and you know, create a living room it's not the lobby mat it's the living room but listen, I, as much as you can mock uh, some of the silly gimmicky stuff like that, you're right. It transformed uh, and maybe even created the lifestyle brand, as we call many, many brands today. So Hilton versus Marriott is five episodes. And yeah. one of the entertaining ways that they handled, I think, very dry material later in the episodes, once you get past the kind of frontier town stories of the of uh, of the first episode or two. You, know, you start getting into mergers and acquisitions and a lot of boardroom finance talk once you get in the 80s and 90s. But you know, one of the entertaining ways that they handled this kind of very dry material is talking about some of the personalities involved in the process of, of these hotels becoming not so much property owners, but brand management companies. Yeah, I thought they, that was probably the best part of the series was the way they explained the separation of uh, where management company and real estate development company uh, were split apart. And uh, and really the, the asset light model, uh, how it was created, why it was created, how it really accelerated the growth of two different kinds of businesses uh, that had been kind of burdened by each other. But those are pretty deep accounting and finance you know, conversations. And I thought they really did an excellent job uh, showing such a pivotal change in the industry uh, in a way that was really consumable for somebody who doesn't want to, you know, a lesson on you know debt finance and capital allocation. Were there any aha moments when you were listening to this? Because you know everything about hotels, essentially. <laughs> was there anything in here that was like, oh, wow, I'd never heard that before? You know, uh, sticking to that same part of the pod about, you know, the asset light model and the creation, Steve Ballenbach was kind of an aha for me. He might be the most important and forgotten person of the last 50 years. And he was central to the Hilton Marriott story. Uh, he ran M&A for Marriott when it, was, when it acquired Host. Uh, he was CFO at Holiday Inn and Trump Hotels briefly. Uh, he returned to Marriott in the mid-90s and led the spinoff of Host, uh, which again might be the most pivotal moment in modern hospitality business structures because it separated the brand management company from the real estate owner. Uh, and Biz Wars did a, a really great job illustrating to the non-finance minded listener how the growth trajectory of those two businesses, Marriott and eventually then Hilton, uh, they were thrust into hyperdrive. And that guy was really behind it uh, when he unencumbered billions of real estate debt from the management companies. Uh, Ballenbach then went to Disney and became CEO of Hilton, something that honestly I'd just forgotten. And there's a whole chapter that either preceded my industry to my entry into the business, or I was just too junior to really recognize at the time. So I really enjoyed the Ballenbach, Ballenbach part. Uh, Hilton didn't spin off Park Hotels until many years later. Was that also Steve Ballenbach? No, that was all Chris Nassetta and the Blackstone backing. Uh, and Business Wars kind of left off that part of the story where Blackstone bought Hilton and Hilton International. Uh, 
brought in Krista setup from host, not a coincidence. Uh, he then delisted both companies, broke these two dysfunctional behemoths into their component parts, rebuilt them, relisted them on the stock exchange, or, you know, NYSE. Uh, and then in 17, Hilton spun off Park Hotels Resorts and Hilton Grand Vacations from Hilton, the brand management company that we all know today. Just to clarify, uh, host is what? A host is the largest REIT uh, in hospitality and like largest by a mile. In the mid-90s, it was at one point called Host Marriott and Host Hotels and Resorts. Uh, it's had a few different names, but the company was all of Marriott's owned real estate, uh, circa 95 or something, uh, was spun off into a different company called Host. And Host is a real estate management company, a real estate ownership company, publicly traded REIT. Um, you know, they own, I mean, the biggest hotels in, in America, really. Uh, the New York Marquee is probably the gem of the bunch. But uh, 100 hotels plus 70% of them are Marriott. And, and Host really just dwarfs other REITs in the business. One of the intimations of the narrative uh, throughout all the episodes, but particularly once you start getting into the into the last thirty years, is that Hilton as a whole is a little bit more of a sleepy operation than Marriott. Marriott's kind of made out as a as a run and gun, always moving, uh, always innovating. Hilton things work. Uh, we're really successful. I don't know how true that is. What do you think? Uh, I. Don't find that to be true at all. Yeah. In the decade that Hilton was reinventing itself, right? Uh, all that we just described with you know merging these two companies, delisting and relisting and all that. During the decade that it took to do that, Marriott was in full growth mode, right? So let's just call it 0, 7 to 17, right? Something like that. Uh, Marriott was acquiring Gaylord. Protea. Then they bought, you know, not in sequence, but bought AC, bought Delta, eventually bought Starwood in 2016. Uh, and at the same time, inventing new brands, Moxie, uh, they created Edition, created Autograph. Uh, Hilton was growing its footprint organically, uh, but it wasn't using its balance sheet like Marriott was to go out and acquire companies for the sake of scale. So, I mean, I guess to that point, like Hilton's approach to growth is more shrewd. Maybe if that's what you meant, I would agree with that. Uh the Hilton philosophy is don't pay a billion dollars for Gaylord, create Signia. Uh, we talked on this show maybe a year ago about not buying Kimpton for $400 million. Just invent Canopy. Why would you buy Choice or Wyndham when you can just invent True by Hilton or Spark by Hilton? And I think in... The MO, the what drives the growth for both of these companies, I don't think there's really a bigger difference than that right there. Marriott uses its balance sheet. It acquires for growth. Hilton's going to do it more organically. There's almost a sports metaphor here between a team that puts a lot of effort into draft picks and another one that goes out and just buys every free agent that they can buy. I can't believe that analogy has never occurred to me. It's so spot on. You know, I mean, If you want to understand Hilton corporate culture, to me, uh, read The Outsiders. Uh, it's basically the MO of Chris Nassetta and the CFO, Kevin Jacobs. Uh, the book shows how eight titanically successful CEOs, uh, and by the way, Warren Buffett might be the only one of them that anybody's ever heard of, well, that most people have heard of, uh, but it takes these incredibly successful CEOs uh, who w their success was based on ignoring conventional metrics that they considered to be distractions. And they focused immensely on capital allocation and cash flow. And that's it. And, and I've heard Chris Nassetta say, we want to be chapter nine of the book, which is, of course, an odd literal quagmire with the term bankruptcy, right? Who stands at the top? What CEO stands up and goes, we want to be chapter nine, right? But knowing the book, that is the heartbeat of how Hilton will grow. What book do you think represents Marriott? Ooh, um, good to great. Shun technology and fads. Like Marriott does that real well. Uh, you know, flash in the pan. What's the big story of the day? And Marriott just kind of keeps its head down, does its thing. A very central focus. Uh, one of the key, it's been a while since I read Good to Great. One of the key parts of Good to Great, leaders ask questions rather than dictate answers. That is, I think, core to Marriott culture and success. 
I know the hotel environment is so different now, but generally, do you think hotel employees, executives stay with one team for most of their careers? You know, it seemed like when you, especially when you were working for Marriott, I know this is a while ago now, but you know, a lot of people you worked with had been there for like 10, 20 years. Like you don't switch back and forth. You don't switch brands. You kind of stay in the brand, work your way up. There's truth to it for, for sure. Um, when I went into Hilton, at, let's just call it the level of people who had been around for 20 years, I, I was very much the outsider. And I'm not, not to say that people weren't welcoming, uh, but you know, my day one, my peer set had all they had two decades of Hilton time behind them. Uh, so that was, you know, it does make changing a little bit difficult. I think that has probably lost some relevance uh, in the last, call it five years, six years. Uh, I think the Starwood acquisition for Marriott really shook that company up pretty significantly. A lot of cheese got moved. And and I think so, you know, there are a lot of people who left Marriott, a lot of people who came into Marriott, like all of Starwood. So I think that may be less true at Marriott today. COVID, of course, rocks both companies to their core. When you furlough 90% of your people and you lay them off, it's a difficult thing to bounce back and then answer your question, Matt. Did people ever leave Hilton? Do people ever leave Marriott? And it's like, well, they do when you lay them off, you know, for a while. And you force people to think differently and consider options maybe they wouldn't have thought through. So I, I do think listen, these are two companies with culture as their heartbeat. It drives who they are every single day. Uh, Hilton has won best place to work two, at least two, maybe three times in the last five years, right? So people don't want to leave. And and I think, you know, Marriott went through a tough time with the Starwood actually, just because it was so much change uh, in the in the world of HR, especially. But I'd be shocked if they don't regain that kind of, you know, those kinds of awards and that kind of longevity if they ever lost it. But, but I It'll be back for Marriott because it's too core to the company you know, the culture that's been around for 90 years, right? You take care of the associate, they'll take care of the guest, and then everything else figures itself out. That's the the core principle uh, at, at the heart of Marriott culture. And that's not changing. It just might have taken a kind of a ding in the last couple of years with a, with a pandemic and the largest acquisition in the business. As we said earlier, the story of hotels in America is – Often the story of brand acquisition, hotel companies seem to be buying and selling all the time. Is there something specifically about the hotel industry that engenders that? Great question. You're going to have to give me these in advance. Uh, (laughs) The first thing that comes to mind, Matt, is that the product itself, the hotel, has a life cycle, right? You build it, it's brand new and shiny. And uh, you might build the best hotel in the city, open it tomorrow. You've got maybe a 10 year run before that shiniest product is pretty worn down from so many travelers coming in and out. Does that product then go from being uh, a luxury hotel to a really nice full service hotel? And that forces a brand change and an ownership you know, group might sell the luxury hotel to somebody else who's going to develop it a bit different way or position it differently. Uh, you see this a lot uh, lower down the chain, right? You'll you build a courtyard. And then when it's no longer up to courtyard standards, you turn it into a comfort inn. Whole brands go through those same evolutions. Right now, Home 2 has, and for the last three years, I think, the largest pipeline of new hotel openings in America. Like hundreds and hundreds of Hilton Home 2s are going to open. And in 10 to 15 years, uh, when we should come back on this podcast in 10 to 15 years and look at this, how many of those home twos are still going to be home twos in 10 to 15 years? Probably not many. Time for a mystery question. Wondery, they loved our analysis of business wars so much that they are giving us full reign to do the next season. What would you choose to be the next focus of business wars? What two companies in opposition to each other would you feature wow taco bell and like zantigo or something like how did taco bell come from you know wait a minute we think americans might like mexican food i don't know when that started and who their rivals were but how did that company become synonymous with the drive-through taco was there a rival for taco bell at any point 
There had to be. I'm sure there were regional ones that popped up, especially out in California. Yeah. But none of them made it. None of them made it to that to that level. How about the fast food hot dog, Matt? Why is it always about the burger? Good question. Why did this country turn its back on the fast food hot dog? I mean, other than Nathan's, can you think of a hot dog that's even known nationally? I mean, Hebrew National as a product, but not as a you know, not as a fast food. It's but right, not it's as a burger. retailer. No, yeah, no. Retail. Wow, this is a good business idea. We should, we should do this. <laughs> What are we wasting our time doing a podcast for? Let's go start a hot dog fast food company. That's God. My my parents tell me that every day. It's great to see you and talk to you. And I will talk to you very soon. Okay. Thank you.